Good morning and welcome to the second session in our full day of webinars hosted by the Community Energy for Energy Solidarity project, or as we commonly call it, the CEES project, C-E-E-S. Um, for those of you who weren't in the first, first session, I'll just let you know a little bit about what we do. We are a Horizon 2020 funded project that is investigating the degree to which energy communities already do or want to start tackling, taking action to tackle energy poverty. Our aim is to help identify which measures are most effective. Uh, I'm Marilyn Smith, founder of the Energy Action Project, re which reports on energy poverty in the EU through its website, Cold at Home. And our role in CIS is to manage communications and dissemination. I'll be moderating most of the sessions today, but also want to acknowledge the work of Sophie Ranson in setting up this event. She'll be ac active on social media throughout the day. And we want to let you know that our hashtag for the day is CIS underscore just transition. So that's capitals. C-E-E-S underscore just transition. Uh, so please use that when you're tweeting and to tag us, use the Arabesque cease underscore energy. So again, capital C-E-E-S underscore energy. Uh, for those of you who weren't able to, to attend the first session, that was really focused on who we are and what we do. So we had presenters talking about key principles such as what is energy poverty, what are energy communities, and how they have been how have they been evolving over the last few years, uh, and also what are the principles of energy solidarity. And we introduced each of the partners uh, very very briefly in the first session. So now for the rest of the day, what we're going to do is give each partner a little more time to talk about themselves and what they do and what they bring to the project. And in the last session this afternoon, we're going to have a a presentation on how do you measure impact and evaluate uh, the effectiveness of your programs. But in this session uh, now we're looking at um, identifying and engaging with people in energy poverty and with other stakeholders. And what we recognize in CIS is that, you know, you, you really can't take effective action until you've identified who you want to help and understand what their needs are. But that is, is really just the very basic first thing you need to do. The second thing is to figure out how do you engage with those people because they tend to self-isolate. It's difficult for them to find organizations that can help them. It's difficult for them to, um, to engage with people. And so that's part of the process of what we're going to talk about today uh, in this session. And the second part is how do you engage not only with them, but with the people that you can that can help you identify. Uh, and particularly if you're new to the uh, energy poverty space, if you're an energy community that's just starting to work on, on tackling energy poverty, then a, a few of the things that you need to keep in mind is that these people are really vulnerable. And so if you can collaborate with organizations that already have strong correct connections and have already built up trust, then um, that kind of engagement with others around you, other stakeholders around you will facilitate the engagement of the people that you that they or you identify as being in energy poverty. So we're gonna cover both of those aspects in the next couple of sessions. We're gonna have two speakers talking about how do you identify uh, people in energy poverty? And then we're gonna have another speaker, two other speakers talking a little bit more about how you engage with those people and with the other stakeholders. So our first speaker uh, this morning is going to be Rachel McNichol from Ali Energy in uh, Scotland. And Allergy Energy is ALI Energy with the ALI standing for the region they work in, which is Argyle, Le Monde and the Islands Energy Agency. It has over 20 years experience in working to address fuel poverty, promote sustainable energy and reduce carbon emissions. Ali Energy's affordable warmth team assists the most vulnerable, disadvantaged individuals suffering from fuel poverty and associated issues by providing specialist affordable warmth advice, training, and a portal for a range of other support services. The Ali Energy team is highly trained and experienced, well-networked, and particularly knowledgeable about the particular challenges, challenges of living, working, and traveling in the remote rural west of Scotland. Rachel has been with Allergy Energy since 2010 and is Deputy Manager and Affordable Warmth Team Leader. She's in charge of day-to-day -day project management and monitoring, 
and she's a motivated professional with long experience in the charitable energy efficiency and sustainability sector. We did have a slight, we, we lost contact with Rachel for a few minutes in our actual presentation. So we will now let you come into the second part of our recording. Help claim to budget and energy efficiency in their home. We can give them life skills that will help throughout their life. Um, when people are unemployed, made redundant or retire, they may experience a huge dip in income and increased need for heat being at home more. Many will have never asked, had to ask for help before. So we work with um, job centres and welfare rights support agencies to try and connect with these people to make them aware that we're here. Young carers may take responsibility for energy bills well before adult age if their parent or guardian struggles with this. They need extra support to understand energy bills, payments and tariffs. Many of the people mentioned above may have gone through a huge life-changing event, so need to be approached sympathetically, carefully, and at a pace suitable to them. Um, how do we engage with these groups? We offer presentations to staff and clients at other organisations. We accommodate their needs by adapting our material to suit their available time, their client groups, and make it clear how our service could support their group. For example, we cover what the schemes, what schemes are available to carers when speaking to the carer group, but won't go into as much detail on carers if we were speaking to a housing association. We offer cozy kits for other organisations to distribute to their clients on our behalf. We've seen an increase in inquiries from other organisations since offering our cozy kits because people like to give useful things out for free. We keep our referral pathway simple and straightforward so that other workers don't feel overwhelmed or put off by lots of paperwork to refer someone. In the first instance, we only ask for minimal contact information and a brief explanation of why the referral has been made. Once we have developed a relationship with the client, we can get more details from them. We ask others to subscribe to our Ali Energy Connect newsletter so they can keep up to date with the service we offer and financial assistance we can access for clients. And it's important to recognise these organisations can help us to improve. We ask them what we can do to make our service more accessible to their clients and what or who is falling through the net with national support. We've recorded lots of positive outcomes through this model. Most importantly, working this way achieves positive outcomes for the individual. There's an increased awareness of our service among staff teams and other organisations. When they see positive results, they will suggest Ally Energy to colleagues. By working with other organisations, there is a reduction in stigma asking for help with energy costs because we are aligned with other supporting organisations in the community. Individuals themselves will recommend our service to others. When people are referred by a trusted person, they feel safer accepting help from Ali Energy. For vulnerable in individuals, we communicate via a support worker. Once a relationship is built, they are then willing to contact Ali Energy directly. Giving out our cosy kits, which have hot water bottles, blankets, heat holder socks, and other energy saving gadgets are a good way to kickstart the relationship. People are more likely to pick up the phone and say, I have received this from my support worker. What else can you do for me? Um, we can reach more people who may otherwise not know of our service or ever ask for help. Working with support workers allows us to keep individuals engaged and respond to requests. For example, if we need to see evidence of income, the support worker can help get a scan copy to us or, use the, um, or visit the individual at home on our behalf. Um, oh, sorry, if I just go back. Mess, mess up a bit. Um, despite lots of successful outcomes for our clients, we still face daily challenges. When connecting with other organisations, we need to try to engage with the right person and the appropriate role and at the right time where they can see the benefit in working with us. For example, as we move into the colder months and winter, we will increase our communications with health professionals um, who will hopefully understand the correlation between living in a cold and damp home and poor health and deaths. I feel many health professionals fail to recognise this correlation. GPs have a 10 minute appointment with patients, so they don't have time to delve into a person's housing and financial situation. If they could pick up on a recurring symptom caused by living in a cold and damp home, then it may avoid future appointments and treatments. We've had feedback from hospital discharge teams who tell us they don't have time to check if the patient has credit in their meter for their heating or if their home is warm and free from damp. 
We're constantly trying to find a way of overcoming this challenge. The level of support we offer can, act, can change and um, access is constantly changing due, due to different funding mechanisms. This means we have to keep other organisations up to date with current support of what is available. We found our newsletter a good way of doing this, but it needs people to subscribe to receive it and then read it. Ali Energy hopes to bring our experience of delivering energy poverty projects in rural, remote and island areas and share good practice for engaging with different groups of people at various stages in their lives when they may need help with energy. Thank you for listening and I welcome any questions you have at the Q&A. Great. Thanks very much, Rachel. And I, I do find the allergy, Ali Energy uh, approach super interesting. And, um, you know, I've been working in, in energy poverty, reporting on energy poverty for a number of years. And yours was the first time I heard of this sort of life change, identifying people at life change. Um, so I'm hoping people will come back with some questions for that. Now I'm gonna flip over and we're gonna hear from Irma Allen. Uh, Irma is the Community Support Services Program Manager at Repowering London. She's got a background in anthropology and over a decade of experience working in research and community engagement on environmental and social issues, uh, social justice issues. She's passionate about promotion, promoting a just transition to a clean renewable energy future based on the participation of those most excluded from the current system. And to give you a little bit of background about repowering, um, it's been uh, working in communities in London uh, since 2011. And I'm not going to say more because I expect that you've, um, you're ready to, to give more background, Irma. So I'll yeah, just happily give the floor Thanks. to you. All right. Thanks, Manny. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. We hear right. you, but we don't yet see your... Yeah, I'm getting, yeah. I'm getting it up. Um, is there that visible? All good? Yep, perfect. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. So, yeah, my name is Emma Allen, and I'm going to be presenting about the value of lived experience and influencing energy policy actors with a particular focus on Ofgem. Um, as Marilyn said, I'm from an organization called Repowering London. Uh, we're obviously a community energy group. Um, we do our work mostly through a rooftop solar project, education and training, running innovation pilots, and through what we call community support services, which is where I sit. So what is our community support services program? Well, um, it's, a, it's a bundle of different activities aimed at uh, supporting those in fuel poverty. Firstly, we used to do one-to-one -one energy advice work for the general public in London, but we actually took the decision earlier this year to, to close that service primarily due to funding challenges and also because as a very small organization, we, we basically got overwhelmed during COVID. So now we uh, offer that one-to-one -one energy advice for participants, particularly who are taking part in our innovation projects and our co-ops. We also offer training to local organizations around um, energy saving tips and consumer rights and protections. We do uh, volunteer uh, opportunities for those with lived experience of fuel poverty to support one another in the community. We uh, do participatory research and co-design work around our innovation projects. And also we try to influence policy at a local and national level via lived experience, which is what I'll be focusing on. So, um, I can't actually see the heading of my slide, but basically this slide is, yeah, talking about, you know, policy influencing, what's in our toolkit. There's lots of different ways that we, we go about this kind of thing. A lot of it's more of the traditional kind. So we respond to consultations, we get involved in, in roundtables and stakeholder meetings. We try to build relationships with key actors. We're very involved in building capacity and coalitions within the community energy sector. So we're one of the founding members of the Community Energy London Forum and the Community Energy England uh, Forum. Uh, we participate in research projects. We, we participate in com campaign coalitions such as End Fuel Poverty Coalition. We do innovation, as I said, and we also are very interested in trying to use what we call, yeah, lived experience and influencing policy. So what is lived experience? So very simply, um, uh, Baljeet Sandhu in an influential report defines lived experiences, the experiences of people on whom a social issue or combination of issues has had a direct impact. 
so in the context of energy poverty, of course, it's you know those people who have actually had experience of living uh, in this condition, um, and it kind of points to a kind of knowing by experiencing rather than by a learned or informed type of knowing. Um, and this type of that kind of knowing is sort of more maybe um, learned knowing tends to dominate most social change and policy work, which is often directed by people who may have not themselves experienced the issues they're trying to tackle. So uh, in focusing on lived experience as a tool for social change, this really emerged from social movements uh, from the 70s onwards uh, with the sort of slogan that came from the disability rights movement, nothing about us without us, uh, pointing to the idea that those with lived experience of a social problem should really be not only necessarily included, but perhaps leading the work to change these issues uh, rather than just being seen as passive, um, maybe like victims or those affected by policy. So, and in fact, history tends to show us that it's when people with lived experience kind of mobilize that major change tends to take place. Um, so, yeah, why is it valuable? Um, there's a growing interest in drawing from lived experience in social policy and social change work, but as Sandu writes, um, it's still an underutilized tool with little traction still within the wider social change and policy sector. And so repowering are kind of interested in, in working with others who are trying to, to shift this. And why, why is it important? A number of reasons. Uh, so it kind of, uh, yeah, sharing lived experience tends to uncover the actual problems people are facing on the ground. Uh, can dispel assumptions about what these problems are or, or in, inaccurate notions that maybe a more ag aggregated data set might, might um, show, uh, kind of gets very granular. Very it challenges. Sorry, I'm just going to interrupt where you're breaking up a little bit. So I'm going to ask oh, also if you would turn your video off and hopefully that'll okay. make the, the audio yeah. better. Thank Thanks, you. Marilyn. Is that is that any better? Let, or le let me know as I go. It sounds good so far. Thank you. Okay, cool. So yeah, it, it challenges power structures. So um, people, as I said, are not uh, represented simply as passive victims or, or uninformed, but are actually valued for the for their knowledge, their embodied knowledge and their experience that it that it brings. Um, it can also, oh, sorry, my slides are frozen. Ah, there we go. <laughs> highlight it can highlight previously hidden and marginalized perspectives and voices again where in big data sets or surveys these voices can be sort of hidden um it can facilitate change by exposing the messy complexity of actual lived lives and their emotional charge so it's sort of really setting up a relationship between those impacted by policy and those making and enforcing it and uh, I guess challenges the maybe dominant rational professional model of policy change as being about um, you know statistics perhaps or evidence which is very important in itself uh, but this way of approaching policy acts is about kind of uh, recognizing that, that we're, we're human we're emotional social storytelling beings often moved through heart as well as head and lastly uh, lived experience work can build the agency of of, of so-called experts by experience into becoming becoming the change makers. Um, so how is lived experience currently, how does it feature in energy policy at present? Uh, so academics Nigel Miss and fellow authors have written that understanding the lived experience of energy poverty is critical in designing energy policies which are fair, effective and aligned with people's daily lives. Uh, there's also a great report by Fair by Design Money Advice Trust, and there are links later in my uh, presentation that maybe you'll receive, uh, who write that regulators like Ofgem, who I'll speak about in a second, need to live the experience of consumers not like us. Only by doing this can they target their work to minimise detriment and maximise consumer welfare. Having said that, however, at the moment, uh, there is a lack of meaningful involvement of people with lived experience in the energy energy sector or in terms of policy development service design and innovation but this is starting to change and this means that dominant policy understandings 
of fuel poverty tend to overlook this everyday kind of emotional aspect of the experience leading to narrow technical problem framings and solutions. They also tend to um, kind of fail to recognise the interrelated um, dynamic aspects of the experience, you know, connected to other issues such as health, social isolation, mobility, employment, education, housing, there's so many complex issues that interplay with it. So we at Repairing are interested in kind of saying that we feel that community energy groups are well, very well placed to promote the value of lived experience with their roots in the community and try to build energy solidarity through um, kind of uplifting that. Um, so over to Ofgem. Uh, so what is Ofgem? Ofgem is the independent energy regulator or watchdog for Great Britain, which was established in 2000. It's responsible for eradicating bad practice in the energy supply sector and ensuring fair treatment of all consumers and fair competition. And it's responsible for working to deliver a net zero economy at the lowest cost to consumers. Um, of course, at, the, at this current moment in time, often have come under heavy fire uh, for, for you know, many, many good reasons. Um, but here, I'm, as I said, we're involved in coalitions that put, try to put pressure on often. Here, I'm talking about lived experience work, which is also about building relations with the regulator. Um, a his sort of bit, a bit of a potted history of often's engagement with lived experience, but basically, um, you know, in response to a growing recognition that in a at the time of liberalisation and privatisation of the energy market, uh, more and more people were falling through emerging cracks and being left behind um, out, out of a sector that based its policies and practices on a, on a kind of notion of an average consumer. Um, and in 2013, often started to shift its priorities towards a focus on vulnerability. Um, and for the next five years, really sort of... Um, try to define and uh, uh, yeah, identify this kind of category of person, energy vulnerable. Uh, but again, this was in a fairly top-down manner using traditional engagement methods such as you know, consumer panels, surveys, advisory groups, working groups, uh, which definitely have their role, but it's a sort of missing that direct contact between regulator and the people that they're regulating on behalf of. Um, so in 2019, sort of in rec increasing re recognizing this gap, they launched the what they call their customer connection program, which involves senior senior people and often visiting charities and opportunities for staff to engage with frontline energy advisors, uh, with the idea of trying to bring those vulnerable pe people closer to to the heart of what they're trying to do. They also increase their focus on inclusive design. Um, user-centered design work, sort of running pilots around that. And then in 2020, um, uh, during COVID, a monthly online consumer group and charity stakeholder group uh, emerged. Uh, and also the CEO started to create one-to-one -one calls with consumers and introduce this complex cases mechanism where they are invite groups like ours to submit three cases, three individual cases a month that they could learn from and, and intervene on behalf of so getting very granular also in response to recognizing how rapidly things have were changing under covid and now obviously during the energy crisis that they really needed to get closer to people to find out what was happening um so you know why are they interested in lived experience um why are they becoming interested they, they feel it strengthens their accountability and credibility it gives them greater clout over suppliers to say We've spoken directly to somebody who has this issue. We know exactly what's going on. We're going to put pressure on you when that does happen. And yeah, increasing effectiveness of policies and innovations, getting clear on what the actual problems and solutions could be and helping to set strategic priorities in a complex, rapidly changing world. So our work with Ofgem, if you can try and see that a bit, <laughs> uh, we, only yeah in 2020 was when we expanded our community support to do this one-to-one -one crisis casework and this was when we were invited to join the consumer groups and charities monthly stakeholder group we responded to consultations we you know 
responded to requests for input to other reviews of, of uh, communications, etc. But we also started to get interested along with other people in that group around how can we bring lived experience closer to, to what Ofgem are doing. Um, just some brief overview of what our key insights on, on the challenges people were facing on the ground were through our work. We're very interested in highlighting that fuel poverty is 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 multi complex broader poverty issue. We're keen to press for energy being perceived as a basic human need. We were seeing how there is inadequate coordination with other agencies and calling for Ofgem to put incentives for suppliers to uh, spot organisational neglect. Um, we called for taking tougher action against suppliers failing to fulfil their minimum obligations. We're also interested in the experiences that people on prepayment or pay as you go meters were having, often those um, experiencing greatest poverty or already sort of this poverty premium. Prepayment meters are more expensive, but consumers often feel they have more control over their energy use through these um, types of meters. But there's issues around safety and practicability for the people with ongoing long term health conditions, for example, issues around poor um, pay point uh, where people go to top up their meter can often be very um, uh, damaging experiences, often in kind of news agents that aren't really fit for that kind of purpose. These are often vulnerable people, so sort of pushing for a different approach to how, how people top up. And we're also concerned about the rising trend of, of forced uh, installments of prepayment meters and trying to ban this practice. Um, so how did we use lived experience to sort of push these messages? Um, I'm just going to highlight three, three interventions that we've made um, since 2021. The first was we sort of really proactively went uh, went to Ofgem and asked if we could come and present our findings from our crisis casework and did so in the form of sort of storytelling, visual storytelling, illustrated storytelling to really, uh, yeah, I guess the idea of stories is really being able to get at that complexity and emotional impact um, that people are going through. So that was one thing we presented at an all-star seminar to about 60 Ofgem officials. Then in March 2022, we set up a consumer call between the CEO of Ofgem and our Lambeth Community Solar Champion who um, does a lot of outreach work in, in Lambeth, uh, one of the most deprived boroughs in the city, uh, and yeah, has her own lived experiences of, of energy access and affordability challenges. Um, so she was really able to sort of put across that, those experiences and what she was hearing in her community to the CEO in about a 20 minute call. And finally, most recently, in uh, last week, in fact, we hosted a roundtable um, between senior Ofgem officials and residents in one of the estates that we work, do innovation projects on, um, uh, where eight, eight members of the community came to share their lived experiences of some of the issues that I mentioned on the previous slides and how this was really affecting their uh, everyday lives and got to sort of tell those stories in their own words face to face with these senior people with power to sort of make certain changes um, and in that round table we focused on the sort of discussion about immediate actions that could be taken to resolve those issues but also systemic actions that we found involved in terms of re redesigning the energy system setting up new energy service supply service companies um, and trying to push for uh, increased access to local energy supply. Um, so here's a few pictures from, from that experience. And just finally, I'm coming to the end, just so Marilyn knows <laughs> that I'm doing that. Uh, what were the outcomes of this? Well, it's, it is obviously hard to track outcomes in terms of immediate immediate policy change but what we felt occurred from these experiences were both from the participant side and the oxygen side um yeah some shifts in in the in the um uh i guess perspectives and how people felt afterwards so 
participants reported feeling respected, meaningfully engaged with, informed, they felt their stories and this life experience that perhaps before they felt quite isolated and um, maybe sometimes ashamed of were, were actually valuable. They felt relieved to share these experiences in the group um, and realised they were not alone, as I said. They appreciated the trust and safety that was established in the group and reported a sense of increased well-being afterwards. They appreciated learning more about Ofgem in, in this very personal manner. Not, not everybody was familiar with who they were or what they did. Um, and they reported increased awareness of their rights as consumers. On the Ofgem start side, they reported appreciating the chance to sort of add this complexity and detail to, to what can often be high level steps and figures for them. They appreciated learning about the key issues on the ground ahead of the winter. There were some uh, issues around smart meter rollout barriers and general energy supply and misconduct and neglect that were key for them to hear. Um, having that granular insight helps them to pressurize suppliers, as I said. Um, the CEO sort of talked about how, how valuable it is to be able to, to phone an energy supply CEO and say, I've spoken to so and so with a name and a location and, and really sort of say, we, we have our ear to the ground, we know what's going on. Um, and they offer a complex case intervention, as I said. And they also talked about how they're looking forward to receiving our application as repairing for a supplier license, which is one of our next innovations. And um, so finally, I think <laughs> what makes a good experience for what makes a good lived experience sort of sharing um, event? Um, very important is paying for participants' time. Too often this doesn't happen, and it's a way of, of really making tangible the value of this lived experience, offering meaningful wraparound support, so really kind of spending time talking with individually each person and offering that energy advice, um, support and intervention into their case before and after, uh, enabling them to tell stories in their own words, in their own style, uh, co-defining the aims and expectations of what the session should be, so really kind of spending time again uh, discussing with the participants what they want to get out of the session and how it should be, how it should run. Meeting where participants feel comfortable and when, so we met in the community hub on the state, so deep professionalizing the space, making it very informal, so people feel comfortable and equal. We spent time setting norms of the space, so talked about confidentiality and respect and equality at the beginning of the meeting. Tried to make it relaxed and enjoyable where possible, even though we're talking about difficult topics, but you know, having tea, coffee, biscuits, these kinds of things. And also to clo closing the circle as in following up afterwards, making sure that um, there's, yeah, not, yeah, that people, it's not an extractive sort of process, but there's an ongoing relationship built. So yeah, there is further to go on the lived experience journey, both uh, for us as empowering and wider. Uh, for the community, there's a sort of further journey to go from being experts by experience to actually becoming agents of social change based on that experience. And that's something that I'm interested in trying to activate through the work that I'm doing. Um, there's further to go internally for us. We'd like to try and bring in people with lived experience in, onto our board. Um, so that it can influence how we make decisions. And there's also further to go, obviously, for Ofgem and other energy policy actors in terms of involving people with lived experience in co-designing policy and new supplier and innovation services. But yeah, that's it from me. Thank you for listening and to look forward to any questions later. Great, thanks very much, Irma. It was really interesting to have that full range of, uh, of perspectives and experiences. Um, because the next part of this session is gonna be more about how do we get energy communities involved in energy poverty, I do wanna give opportunity for question and answer right now for the first part of the discussion, which is how do we identify uh, people in energy poverty and then how do we engage with both them and with um, the other stakeholders and actors um, that both Rachel and Irma described. So I'm, I'm just curious, does anybody have any specific questions or comments related to this first discussion about identifying and engaging 
uh, in this, this space. Um, one of the things I'm a bit interested about uh, to, to either of you is, you know, as a journalist, I come to, into these situations uh, trying to get a story, um, but you're doing something very, very different. You're putting people together with um, somebody who can potentially change their situation. And I'm just curious if, there, if you run into any specific aspects of what's the disconnect between what people's lived experiences are and what the people who may help them understand about those experiences. Is there any sort of, you know, really big disconnect that you see being problematic in, in what you're trying to do? Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, yeah, I mean, there's obviously a big disconnect. Uh, a lot of it has to do with with the uh, with socioeconomic background, with the uh, class, you could say. Not always. It's not always the case, but obviously, definitely in the communities we work with on on estates in in London, um, there's a clear, um, you know, especially in this country, in the UK, a clear uh, difference in often educational levels but also just yeah income levels but ethnicities or, or those kinds of so there's there's so much in um trying to communicate you know a lived experience a lived a life <laughs> that is so complex and woven into so many um different aspects i guess it's it's in a way in a way the t time is is the main um barrier you know, in, in that round table people only had about 10 to 15 minutes to get across this complexity of, of their lived lives and and they did they did that beautifully and at the same time there's so much that's left out of that you know I have a background in anthropology and as in that context I have I had the luxury of a whole year of field work you know spending a whole year living amongst people to understand their lives obviously people in Ofgem and at Repairing we can't do that but through our innovation projects, like for example, this one we're doing home monitoring for well-being, which is around indoor air quality as well as energy um, access issues. It's a 12-month study, so there's very much this opportunity to build quite long-term relationships that is quite unique. Um, and I guess that's the challenge with the policymakers; they don't get to build those long-term relationships. But if we can do that work, maybe not yeah on their behalf or sort of really bring what that depth can offer which is what i think community energy groups can can do if we have that access and it's about the funding as well if we have funders who who who, who care about and understand lived experience we can get the money to to do projects that get, enable that long-term relationship building great rachel did you want to add anything about disconnects <clears throat> uh the area we cover, the huge disconnect we see is the, the lack of um, recognition of people's different, the, of accessibility. Um, a lot of things now are moving to online. Um, a lot of applications for, for financial support are moving to online. A lot of our population, um, first of all, don't have access to online because the, the connections are so poor um, and they don't have the financial means to have a laptop or to have data on their phone. Um, the other accessibility issue we're, we're seeing a lot more common now is that um, a lot of churches and um, community centres are opening up for sessions throughout the winter um, to provide free warmth and sometimes free warm food. Um, that's great if you live in a city or a town and it's just down the road, but we have lots of people that um, you know are on a half an hour bus ride um, to get to these places and the, the public transport timetable um, isn't great so they, they, they just can't access these free areas of support um, so yeah accessibility is a huge issue in the media that we cover. Great um, well we will move on to our next speaker but keep thinking of, of what you've heard in these first two presentations for the Q&A that we'll have at the end uh, and as I said what we're going to focus on now is how do we uh, get energy communities to start being interested in tackling energy poverty. Uh, and, you know, I was talking to a researcher recently who's, who was trying to research 
how participating in energy communities had changed the lives of people in energy poverty. And basically what he found is there's very, very, very little present, uh, participation going on. Most energy communities are owned by um, well-educated, wealthy males, and most people in energy poverty don't even know that energy communities exist yet. And so that's a really huge disconnect that we hope to address partly through CIS. Um, but I want to hand the floor over to Yao Lopez, who is with Copernico, which is based in Portugal. It's a very interesting community energy project. Uh, it's a nonprofit renewable energy cooperative that produces and sells electricity and provides diverse energy services to its members. And Copernico has been around for a while. Uh, Yao's background is that he's his, in Copernico, he's the communications and social projects officer. Uh, and he's a sociologist who is currently responsible for internal and external communications of the cooperative, as well as for managing this, uh, the CIS involvement. And also he's in a second H2020 project in, uh, in Portugal, which is called Power Poor. So yeah, off to you. Thank you, uh, Marilyn. I will share my screen now. Is there too much echo in this room? Yeah, okay, I will, tr I will, sorry, I'll have to cover my mouth a little bit. That works much so, better, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So, um, hello everyone, I'm João. Um, I work, as Marilyn said, I work in the social projects related to energy poverty in Copernico. Copernicu is a non-profit and national-wide cooperative that is focused on empowering people in the energy sector, producing, selling, and providing energy services to our members. Uh, I had actually prepared to talk only half the time here, but uh, unfortunately, Paula from ZDZ is sick today, so I think I'll take the opportunity to talk a little bit bit more about Copernic. Uh, Anna Rita is also here with us. She's the executive coordinator in Copernic and maybe later she will, she may want to add something and help answering some questions. Um, we currently have 2,500 2, members around that. Almost 2 million euros invested in photovoltaic projects and around 800 clients. Uh, we have three main areas, uh, that's production, where members of the cooperative collectively invest in photovoltaic solar production projects. We have supply of energy, and we still are the only non-profit supplier of energy in the country, and also the only renewable energy cooperative doing so. And uh, more generally, we provide energy services like this European H2020 projects, like CIS. Uh, we also have some partner partnerships. Uh, we purchase surplus energy from members. We facilitate in creation of energy communities. Well, and we, we, we are involved in many things related to this mission of empowering people in the energy sector. So now going on from my for my part, um, it is possible to tackle energy poverty in a variety of ways. And even before we really used this term, we were doing things to do it because empowering people in the energy sector obviously has many connections to tackling energy poverty and tackling energy poverty has many connections to empowering people in the energy sector. So, um, uh this is this is really a cross-cutting area um so for example when we started to supply electricity in 2019 we were among the cheapest suppliers and the one that had the most satisfied customers according to a consumer rights organization and uh although i'm suspect I would say that this was only possible because we are not suppliers to make profit, but to be a fair and collective tool of supplying the basic necessity that is having electricity. 
Um, and of course, one of the things that we do when talking to our clients is, for example, to advise them on how to reduce their spendings. Um, also, right with our first uh, European project in 2016, focused in energy efficiency, we started having conversations about energy efficiency with our members, taking into account that energy efficiency means uh, energy savings, energy sobriety, and energy solidarity, which is also to fight energy poverty. Um, and going a bit back in the timeline, our first activity were the cooperative loans. Uh, and these are collective investments made by our members in renewable energy production, in social and public uh, entities that often struggle to pay their energy bills. Um, so this was our first and still is uh, going on. Um, but since 2017 that we have been wanting to extend this model to households. Uh, so to create collective investments uh, for individual self-consumption systems to members that cannot afford the initial costs of these kind of systems. Um, and this has proven to be a challenging task. Last year, we launched what would be the first step of this campaign, that uh, collective purchase campaign for solar panels that would include low-cost loans to finance the participation in this collective purchase campaign. Uh, so we, we actually collected the interest of many members. And unfortunately, the high prices of materials caused by inflation and the war in Ukraine are still blocking the way forward in this. But uh, we still are very much wanting to do that. Um, and right now, an ever-growing area of activity for us is the facilitation of creation of local energy communities. And in this, we always try to promote inclusive models, aiming at the participation of people with different financial capacities, whether in the direct support we give or in the numer numerous dissemination activities and actually this past few weeks have been really vibrant. We had a lot of events. Um, so yeah, we always try to promote inclusive models um, when we build capacity in Portugal to create energy communities. Um, so with all this said, I think that tackling energy poverty is something that's really natural to energy communities and cooperatives because it's it it's in our core mission so um it is inextricably linked to empowering people in the energy sector um and now uh to wrap all this up um we started having energy poverty related projects in 2020. So only in that year did we get power poor project. And only then did we start having a line of work specifically about energy poverty. But what I hope I could show to you is that this is a continuation of something and not a brand new thing to us. Um, in Power Poor, we develop ways of, way of raising awareness and help Power Poor people. Um, and it, it's, it, it has many similarities with CIS. Um, and then in 2021, CIS came in to help us develop new ways of engaging with energy poor people, and namely through workshops, energy cafes, that I will be talking a little bit later in our next webinar session. And I hope to see you all there. Um, so uh, how much time do I have, Marilyn, still?
sorry, you have lots of time. <laughs> so, um, do you want to talk a little bit more about power pour? I know that you're going to come back and talk about cease later, but maybe we can take a few minutes mm -hmm. here to talk okay. about power pour, even though you don't have any presentation for it, but just give us people an idea yeah. of what it's doing. Okay, so, yeah. So in, in power pour, um, the main aim is to support programs, schemes for energy poor citizens and uh, encourage encourage the use the usage of alternative financing schemes also establishing energy communities crowdfundings um uh, to work with liaison with um, municipalities um to create uh local energy poverty alleviation offices um we train uh people in all the country to become energy supporters and energy mentors um and these people are supposed to uh help people with in through home visits um and uh well power poor is also in general facilitates experience and knowledge sharing and the implementation of small scale energy efficiency interventions. Um, so it really has a lot of similarities with CIS. The only, well, not the only, but the biggest difference is that CIS is really focused on um, energy communities, while Power Poor has a lot of different partners. We are obviously an energy cooperative, but there are companies there also. and. Uh, different kinds of associations while in seas it's more focused in energy communities to to develop energy solidarity tools and measures um so yeah i think th there's also in powerpoint there's also a toolkit that includes a power target to help identify people in energy poverty uh power act to help to give tips of to, to implement measures in houses and a power fund that's supposed to be like a, a marketplace platform with all everything that some that someone can do to fund or support what they want to do related to energy poverty um and uh, if we still have time, and if Anarita is still there, if you want to add something, you can. <laughs> we definitely have time. Please go ahead, Anarita. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, um, Copernicus is really um, has this uh, goal to, to help uh, citizens in Portugal um be able to pay their own bill of energy and uh, with that we are trying to develop several um activities for example in power poor we are helping municipalities to develop their own um regional or local energy um local strategy to tackle energy poverty but it's not so simple because in in portugal the, the municipalities they they don't know how to handle or how, how to deal with this uh, new concept of energy poverty even even though portugal is the seventh uh country in Europe with the, the highest level of citizens in energy poverty. But it's a really new issue in Portugal that we only start to talk about it uh, during the pandemic uh, because we had to stay at home 24 hours and suddenly 80% of the population uh, understood that the houses were not comfortable. So, uh, saying this, in Power Pool, we are trying to, to open cabinets to citizens to go there 
and can have advices how to handle their energy bill but it's not but it's more complicated than that it's not only about having a space it's how to 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 communicate and to reach these people because usually the cooperatives um and i, I can talk about Copernic, the cooperatives usually, the, our members are very high educated people, uh, middle and up middle class, and men and white men, and middle age. So it's not so easy for a cooperative that it's a national cooperative, um, get to, to or um uh it's not so easy for us to to go and talk with some of the classes of our population but we are trying to do that um putting uh, or contacting the local associations uh, the, the 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 civil parish that is the level of a uh, local government that we have in portugal etc but yeah but and and power and uh, energy poverty in the end in portugal it's only about for me it's only about um having a good strategy to renovate to building renovation we we really don't need to heat and cool our houses if we had a net bed and net zero buildings for everyone. So it's a, yeah, it's a very big, big, big challenge that uh, if we had a very a good national strategy that it's in pause for one year and we don't know why we already asked to the government, to the Secretary of State of Energy, why this public, uh, this um, long-term strategy for fighting energy poverty were not published yet because the public consultation happened one year ago and it's not published yet and nobody answered to us. So yeah, and that, that's our my, my thoughts about energy poverty and how Copernic is trying to have a strategy with the help of this projects they are very important for this uh, and with the help of our members that for example yesterday we have a, a seminar of our pool project and it was very good to see how how cooperatives can have volunteers to go to the houses of other people to to give advices to to them about uh, how to to save energy or how to read their own energy bills so it was it was really good and i think copernico can can uh, do more uh on on this field thank you and please ask us things thank you Thanks to, to both of you. Um, one of the po points that you brought up, Rita, was, was exactly what I mentioned be, when I was introducing you, this who owns energy cooperatives. And so I'm curious whether you've been able to um, get those you know, well-educated, fairly wealthy white men interested in how the cooperatives that you already have operating, how, how can, are they interested in energy poverty? Are they interested in tackling energy poverty? Or are you kind of having to do that, the energy poverty story a bit separate from, well, not separate, but you know, how do you, how do, you do that? How do you get your members to buy into tackling energy poverty? Well, uh, Copernico, we have um, a, a, a group of, retired people that are that are our members and they they they, they want to have to, to be active retired people and suddenly energy it's a thing that uh, concerns 
to all of us and and we we can uh, put them working and they don't want to receive money so that's good for us and um and and they 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 feel useful for something for example we have retired people from the energy sector that help us to um in in the public consultations that and some of them are very specific and other people can help copernico in in going to the market presenting copernico and other ones they are they are part of this group of mentors and supporters for power pool that goes to to the houses of other people so and that well it's more about them that as and then we, we just give give them work to do and and that's really, <laughs> really good great and it's, great it's good for us and it's good for them of course it's only maybe one percent of copernic members it's not that we have lots of volunteers but one volunteer with this with all this energy can 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 um, contaminate in a positive way of course uh, other other ones so yeah that's and now we have to 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 go and now of course i think that the other step is to give them knowledge enough to start a local energy cooperative that's more complicated but i think we can go there we need more uh, support for the legislation because it's the legislation is not so good in portugal but that's that's the other step yesterday i we we organized um, a workshop about uh, how to build a collective soft consumption and one of the questions were that that we put people uh the citizens um thinking you know, in um uh we want the citizens or that community to think to, to think in solutions is that how we are going to integrate people that cannot uh invest in uh, production how we are going to integrate them are we really we are we going to put them apart uh, apart just because they don't have 500 euros or can we as community have a solution for that maybe if the other put more 20 year euros maybe that family can be part of the community it's really important the money or it's more important to have everyone on board and this kind of questions we need to 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 start to put in the in the communities because our communities are a little bit selfish about their themselves and it's really important to i think it's really important for people and urban uh neighborhoods to start to think as a community again yeah that's why we are also working with the groups in transition i don't know the, the term in english uh but uh, maybe joan knows more than me better than me uh we are trying to or thinking in in working with the groups in transition uh because they they are trying to to to, to put these, these questions about the community again um in the middle of the the, the communities in uh urban areas that usually are more selfish than the rural areas yeah okay and now i stop to <laughs> think we, we do have a, a I think it's the transition transition network, you know, okay. that cities are part of. Okay, great, thanks. We do have a question from uh, Liv in the who's listening in today, um, and it's what measures 
is Copernico taking to reach out and include vulnerable communities, which you've just kind of made reference to uh, when it comes to starting up energy communities? And have you got any lessons that you can share from along the way? Any answers, Juan, or should I answer? Well, I, I can start maybe. Uh, so yeah, as Anarita said, we when we try to facilitate and promote energy communities, we <laughs> so one thing we say a lot is um, in Portuguese, energy community starts with the community. It, we say comunidade de energia, so we say that community energy communities start with communities uh, so we we try to because there are many some companies trying to promote a more like business model about this uh, concept and we try to promote something that is as rita said inclusive and that's not just the money important in this but also the participation and if we think about it, I think it makes, I mean, th th there are many studies that say that um, uh, inequal, inequal, unequal societies are worse for everyone, even the richest person. So I think that also applies in local communities. People that, if, if everyone can be part of some energy community, I think it will benefit even the richest members of that community. So, so, but the question was, what measures are we taking to reach out and include vulnerable communities? So, well, it's it's this is what our projects, Seas and Power Poor, are helping us to. We are being able to contact municipalities, and they have a lot of knowledge with um, their social action departments. So that's a good way to, to reach out to more vulnerable citizens because it's hard for us that just, uh, as Rita said, being a very man and white organization, it's hard to us to reach out to them, but with, with the help of local associations, partners, municipalities, it's it's uh, it's what we try to do to reach out to these households, and uh, we, we are actually also uh, part of the of a um, working group from Rescoop. That's the um, energy, uh, gender power working group, where we also are trying to engage more women in the energy transition and to include them because that's also proven to be a very important aspect to mitigate energy poverty. And if we think about it, it's usually, uh, there are more women in energy poverty. And uh, so we really have to take steps to include more women in, in this. Well, I can add one thing. It's um, what I learned until now about energy poverty is that uh, it's much more difficult to work on this issue that I thought um, because we are not really in contact with citizens in energy poverty and um, and another thing and and other thing is that um, in Portugal we don't have local energy communities working yet what we have is energy services company that are selling energy communities as energy services or that they are selling energy services as energy communities. So it's not the community that is building their own uh, energy community. So we don't have, if we don't have energy communities working, we cannot try to um, put the problem about energy poverty and the includes and the include everyone in there because there there is no where to include uh, so it's it's a, a lot of issues altogether but one thing 
we know we are not in the in Portugal. Uh, we can talk about and we can solve the problem of energy uh, of energy poverty when we when we uh, uh, have the path to the energy democratization or energy democracy and we are not still there because we cannot put people producing their own energy uh, or a community um, even if they have money because they don't know how to do it the, the, the who has money don't know how to do it so and who don't have money don't know how to do it and don't have money so and you are adding problems and so yeah so yeah you know, I'd, you, like yeah. To, yeah. I'd like to open so, the floor to um, yeah, yeah, yeah. if, if yeah. there's anybody from an energy community that has gone through this experience already uh, of engaging uh, people in the energy poverty of it, because this, this is part of the reason CEASE was set up is because we recognize that most energy communities just want to sell and produce, uh, produce and sell energy. And I'm wondering if anybody that's participating as, uh, in the webinar has more more experience or recent experience in how do you bring the energy tackling energy poverty part into an energy community does anybody want to turn on their microphones and have a yeah i can speak a, to a bit to okay that. irma yeah irma go ahead and um let's just yeah. see if anybody else wants to as well okay yeah sure thanks it, really interesting to listen um to copernicus presentation um i guess one thing i wanted to say was that um you know who's in energy poverty that the number of those people is obviously growing and growing in the uk it's you know 40 percent of the population predicted to be rising to maybe 60 percent so i just wanted to flag that of course it's important to talk about vulnerability and energy poverty as a very specific issue but it's it's unfortunately becoming mainstream and there's something about vulnerability as well that that's a growing kind of sector of people but on the other hand at repowering we're very keen we're, we're talking about at the moment um about how can we engage uh more diverse people into our energy co-ops and a lot of it some of it is around how how do we speak about our co-ops in the past uh it's often been obviously through it through a very much tackling climate change lens and uh but obviously that tends to preach to a sort of certain crowd and some people care about climate change but in the current context of the cost of living crisis it's also about finding other inroads into opening these conversations so it's not necessarily about yeah climate it's going to be about you know perhaps it's about um freeing like taking back ownership of of energy to use some language that might appeal to certain types of people or it might be about we can't promise that an energy co-op is going to solve energy poverty issues like that but there's sort of future hope and ambition that this is what community energy can deliver eventually so sort of speaking about it in those ways so we're having a lot of internal conversations precisely about how to speak in the current context using different messaging i think that's really important anybody else uh, want to pop up with some experience or advice or more questions rachel do you have anything that you want to I was just going to say, we use the term affordable warmth as a positive spin on energy poverty because there's a lot of shame and embarrassment attached to being in poverty. So um, we use the term affordable warmth in the hopes that we engage with more people because it's it's easier for someone to say they're accessing affordable warmth support than fuel poverty support because everybody wants to, to be warm and afford to be warm. Um, so we found that to be really, really useful since we, we made that change a number of years ago. I think this is an interesting uh, uh, shift in language or an important way of talking about it. Um, and one of the things that I've heard before about Portugal is most houses don't have central heating at all. And most people just expect that you'll be kind of cold all winter. So the idea that you should be able to be warm and afford to be warm is, is basically kind of new in Portugal. Is that accurate, would, would you say, for Anarita or Yao? Yes, yes, it is. Uh, go ahead, Rita. Go, 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 John. I, I, I can. 
Uh, so yes, it is uh, pretty much normalized the cold. And although many um, foreign people think Portugal is a hot country, there are many places, especially in the north and the mo most in the mainland, that that they can really get very uh, cold and also very hot. So. Uh, yeah, it's it's real. It's uh, normalized, and and also there's another problem, because uh, if people don't pay, I, I think this may be different in other European countries. But if people don't pay their bills, uh, they get they get disconnected very rapidly, and um, so there's this interesting um, uh, indicator in Portugal where you have like people that um, struggle to pay their energy bills that, to keep their houses comfortable is like one of the, um, the highest, highest countries in the list in Europe. But then if you go to the indicator of arrears on utility bills, then it's one of the lowest ones. And I think that since people pay their bills, this uh doesn't really become a social problem it's a very individualized problem and people think it's their problem and not a social one yeah yeah and, and um i think it's um it's cultural uh not to hit the house the houses it's um if uh, if uh, well there is a book there is a uh, author, novel author that I, I really like from the beginning of the 20th century. And in one of the books, there is a guy that goes to a, a, a house of a judge. And the the judge is, it's cold outside, and the judge is with the bla blanket in the in the legs, and, and the house is not heated. So it's really cultural. It's not about money. It's... Um, about we have two months of um, of uh, cold, so we can handle, it and we don't need to hit the houses. But I think the I think the goal. Well, we sh we don't need to hit the house to be comfortable at home. If we had good patterns of renovation. Maybe we could, we need to, to hit the home for one, two months, and then we don't need centralized to, to, to put a centralized heating system to do that. But, and uh, so we don't need to use energy to be comfortable at home. In the end, it's, it's, it's this message that we are trying to put on the table. We just need to have good houses and good insulation and good windows and um, and yeah that's it and because of that Copernic is uh, is trying we applied to be a provider of um, to help people with social tariffs to go for public funds to put uh, solar panels and to change windows and we are doing this we are yeah, we 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 want to to be able to help people to go to this kind of calls and help them to to get the money, public money, to do, to do some renovations at home. Yeah, uh, we're we're it's just wrong. coming. Yeah. Oh, did somebody it, else want to? May May I just add one one other thing that many people uh, say in our in our events is that in Portugal because there's two extremes so Portugal is in the extreme of not caring about comfort in the house and then in northern European countries you want to have a t-shirt all year round while in house so many people say that we don't have to go to that extreme so that there are some temperatures a range of temperatures where people are still comfortable and it's still healthy to live with that temperature. So we just have to adapt. To, like I'm not sure of what the numbers are, but imagine if from 18 degrees 
to 25 degrees. So maybe in the winter you will uh, you should have you should aim at at least 18 degrees and at in summer at least 25. So it can be arranged, not having all the time 25 degrees in the house. It's funny you brought that up because I was going to make exactly the same point coming from Canada, where we have much bigger houses than we need um, and quite a lot of energy that's not very expensive. People do expect to walk around their house in, in um, you know, t-shirts and, and shorts all winter, which is just ridiculous to me. Um, but I think one of the things that is coming out of the current energy crisis, certainly, you know, I'm, I'm Canadian by background, but I've been living in France for 20 years. Uh, and right now there's a you know, very big push in France for energy sobriété, which is the idea of using enough energy. And this is definitely, you know, in response to the crisis. And, you know, um, when Emmanuel Macron was, was talking about this, he had a turtleneck on with his suit jacket rather than a shirt and tie. And it was kind of making the point that, you know, you can put it, you can wear different clothing and you can do different things. Um, so I, I think one of, one of the messages that is really interesting to come out of this energy crisis is to, to help people that, don't have sufficient access to energy or can't afford sufficient access to energy, that that is an unjust systemic thing. But to for, for those of us who live well and have never really thought about how much we pay for energy or how much we use, which I would, I would say is largely my case, um, to, to really take those steps and think about how can I participate in reducing overall energy demand and therefore reducing emissions and you know keeping my own bills more under control uh, in a way that that doesn't have a negative impact on my lifestyle um, and that's really quite easy for some of us to do but I think those of us who are in that situation really don't understand how 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 difficult it is for people uh, in 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 the really vulnerable categories and to so I think you know, this whole discussion about how do we uh, present the lived experience, how do, who needs to understand that lived experience because they're decision makers either at, at the policy level or within an energy company or within an energy community. How do we get all of those actors to understand the lived experience and realize that there is ways to make the lived experience better for people in, through energy communities. Uh, so if there's no more questions, we'll close this session, but I'll remind you that we do have another I'm session. I'm sorry, coming. I'm sorry. I, I, can I, can I, I'm sorry. Can I, yeah, sure. we have Katerina Al here from uh, one municipality, one municipality in Portugal, Almada. Katerina, can I challenge you to talk about um, under Horizon 2020 project? Yeah, or I'm sorry if you don't want, please just then people can. They, she she wrote on chat. It's sun for all, and it's in a public, um, in a social housing from municipality, and they are really putting PV and doing energy community. So I think it's very interesting and. And yes, certainly. Kat I Katerina, if you'd like to turn on your microphone yeah. and have a yeah, please. Great. Just uh, I think I think she left because she oh. said she she had to join another meeting, but she will join us later. Okay. In the other uh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll, yeah. I'll send her a message on the side and tell her we'll make a bit of time for her later on. So thank you, everybody. Yeah, Super interesting it's... discussion. Uh, and you. we will see you at one o'clock. Have a good lunch. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. See you later.